Well, good day, fellow co-inhabitants. How are y'all doing out there? You listening to the Killogic Effect? Special edition. We got a pretty killer uh, interview coming up with Artem, the organizer, one of the organizers of the Ecstatic Fear compilation. It's a two this compilation that you can uh, go check out they got an indiegogo up we got all the uh, links and everything provided but uh yeah so uh we're gonna have a uh, sit down with mr uh artem and uh hear all about the band ecstatic fear and all about this uh compilation which is bringing bands together from all over the globe for one common thing here and I think it's a uh, it's a very uh, awesome thing so uh, why don't we uh, why don't we uh, just uh, get uh, right into it get comfy and uh, get ready to talk with uh, Mr. Uh, Artem the uh, organizer of the Ecstatic Fear Global Tribute mm, let's dig it Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Organizer of the Aesthetic Fear with Solemn Hope Imbued compilation. How are you doing today, sir? Doing well, thanks. How are uh, Logic and everyone? <laughs> well, hello, sir. Tell us um, a little bit about this um, this compilation you're working on and, uh, and and what it's all about. Well, generally, I could probably start with the history of the band Aesthetic Fear and the reason why we decided to make this tribute. So Aesthetic Fear is a little-known jewel, a pearl from Austria. So it's uh, the band plays or played, it's it's a confusing matter. Anyway, uh, they recorded and released two albums in 1996 and 1999. And the albums, uh, they are a very special listen experience. So some people who know those albums, they just call those the best metal albums ever made. Well, that does sound poshy, but well, after listening to those two albums for over 16 years, I would say that they actually put a spell on you and uh, you can never get released from it. Right. I, I, I think when people say that, it's just a really way of defining that this is an epic album that, uh, you know, has touched me or that has moved me. And, you know, there there are um, a, a finite amount of albums that do that with all the music that we have. So when I hear people say that, it, it does, you know, really pique my interest. Well, you know... Sometimes it's subjective, sometimes it's uh, objective to some extent. Right. So, but it, about the static first music, it's highly eclectic genre wise. It mixes uh, atmospheric to metal, certainly death metal elements, the death metal vocals, <laughs> <laughs> with uh, neoclassical music, folk music of Europe, which nice. is you know, highly academic kind of music. Right. And uh, the 
Yeah. Also, it's kind of, it's uh, has a definite gothic flavor, and um, it's uh, this mix. The main thing, it's really organic. So we know sometimes some bands uh, like I don't know Metallica and Symphony. So it was all right, but still you could feel that these are not fully blended in one. Right. But here it goes like in total perfect harmony with aesthetic feeling. Not not so uh, hyper produced feeling. But these are very uh, not fully. Well, like you said, very organic feeling. One. Right. And highly inspired. So it goes basically, like, so instead of here, they released only two albums, and the, not in the way the band split up after the first album, and on the second album it was only the composer, whose name is Matthias Kogla, and uh, uh, guest musicians. Ah. So, so was yes. this like music that had been written prior? Because you, you know how that usually works out. Like a band will be, a lot of times a band will already have an album ahead of time written. It just hasn't been recorded, you know. Um, or was that? Do you think that was music that they they wrote well, f for that album? As far as I know, uh, so Matthias, so he, the band when it started, so. Basically, Matthias Kogla, he wrote all the music and lyrics. Oh, right. And, and the other guys, they contributed, uh, they kind of adapted his theoretically written parts, he, which he composed on a computer, you know, like sterile parts. Uh, they adapted those parts uh, into real metal parts, bass and uh, guitars and drums and vocals. Right. Uh, and about the second album, I believe that Matthias composed uh, it uh, over the three years between uh, the two albums. So I think it was. Uh, so both albums are highly inspired, and it's pure, genuine music, like without any commercial cliches applied. Right, yeah. Like I was, yeah, like I was referring to, like the hyper produced and, yeah, commercialized type of um, music. I think, um, I think that can, comparison that people would, would probably uh, draw just from hearing those types of things, even though they're probably totally different, is um, like a band like um, Tool or King Crimson or, um, you know, that they're not the mainstream, they, you know, they're, uh, you know, uh, enlightened. <laughs> kind of niche uh, yes. products. Yes, niche, yes, perfect word, niche. Yeah, which, for the people which is, appreciate more and more music has become niche nowadays, and it's awesome. Yeah, well, prog metal, there, again, in prog metal, like, there are plenty of bands which are which started as super inspired but then gradually ran out of inspiration unfortunately but sometimes they still regain their inspiration uh, presently I'm referring to Dream Theater right yeah mm -hmm. so uh, but uh, niche products again I would say that uh, quite frequently it's only several albums and then the band unfortunately disappears and uh, it's very seldom commercial success Right, so it it would make sense why a lot of people, um, that, well at least over here that I know of, haven't um, heard of Ecstatic Fear. I mean, I hadn't heard of them until this this came along, and Bangalow told me about it, and yeah. that's how I uh, um, met you. Was well, yeah. So about the tribute itself, so it's there. There were no albums from Aesthetic Fear released for 20 years. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. But um, at the same time, however, their music was spreading for all those two decades. It was ah. spreading through the internet mostly. And it oh, spread yes. so locally, so I, it would, would be really hard to imagine, like, why would an Austrian niche symphonic to metal band be known among the metal fans in Syria, 
Vietnam, China, Russia, um, Chile, and um, Canada, and uh, Israel, and um, uh, it's just so many countries. Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, my homeland, Kyrgyzstan. So it's, it would really be impossible to foresee that happening. But the Internet right. made that possible. Well, the power of the Internet. Totally. That's what Plus, helps connect a lot of music. I mean, people are hearing music from, you know, like like your area and places they would have never have. They wouldn't get there any other way, you know. Absolutely. You know, the Static first album, the albums they were only released in Austria, in South Korea, and in Russia. Oh wow! But in South Korea, it was limited print, and in Russia, it was uh, kind of. Not really pirate, but semi-official. Ah, I see. So how I found out uh, how global aesthetic fear music became. So myself, I heard this music for the first time in uh, 2004. I discovered it from an MP3 portal. And back then I adored like bass solos and metal instrumentals. And well, I still do. So I, right. was, I would input like solo or instrumental in uh, the MP3 portal's uh, search line, and then would just download random songs which were solo and, or instrumental and belonged to, the, to a certain genre. For example, doom metal or oriental metal or progressive metal. Right. Yeah, and uh, this way I discovered a step here. Hackard, Liquid Tension Experiment, and Orphan Land. Like, and these are still the top four of my favorite bands. You you sent me um, these... Uh, oh, f first of all, I thought the video was pretty neat, but um, the uh, these guys are badass. I love the mixture and the ethnicity in it. It's just... It's got those... That that awesome metal feel that you know that you love and everything but it's just it's got a lot of the uh the uh different um ethnic feels in them from you know yes orphan land they are very special and one of a kind just like aesthetic here and it's organic badass. yeah they are super organic metal and oriental instruments and oriental chants now that's which is which is the one that had the, uh, where they're all eating dinner? I think that was the first one, where they're sitting down to eat that song right there. That ri I listened to that one a couple times. That's kick-ass. They got a, I just, uh, I love all the stuff that's, uh, that's in that. And that's another thing that I think, um, metal really gains from is, being able to draw from all of these these different areas of the world, and you don't I, I don't know it maybe it's my ignorance, but it doesn't seem like that really is the same in other genres of music. It's like it seems like metal ha really has an ability to draw from a lot of areas and pull in a lot of different things, and like I said, like that ethnic feel and stuff like that where. Like, say, if it's a pop star, it's just a pop star in another language. You, you, you know what I'm saying? It's like a lot of them genres don't, it doesn't seem to cross over as much or in as many different areas as metal can. And, uh, Absolutely. These, and I think these are prime examples of that. Yeah, I would say that metal can be mixed with anything and uh, kind of kick us in any, like, Mixes. Well, look at baby metal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, I when I Super saw funny. that, I it was like I couldn't believe that I it was like this works. I couldn't believe it. You know, and like it or not, that's some awesome stuff. There's a lot of good music in that, and the fact that that all is taking place on the same stage at the same time. Yeah, it's it's really awesome. It, you know, it's impressive. But um. I I would say eclectics is the key. Yeah. When you pick some elements which uh, anyone would hardly mix together ever and still 
someone like mixes those things and it turns out to be really unique, really special. Mm, that's the thing. It pulls out so uh, so many different uh, fans too, and it crosses crosses the uh, those little genre barriers that people put up. <laughs> oh yeah, and uh, another example would be apocalyptica, for example, like cello metal. So it's uh, both uh, like classical music, symphonic music fans and metal fans come to their concerts. That's awesome. And another very splendid example I, I want to share. Yeah, like it's a bit like several steps ahead of uh, the line of uh, the the interview. Or, I mean, the tribute story. So it's a bit ahead uh, and. Um, for the tribute, we were also looking for someone with oriental sound, oh, and right. I found a guy from uh, Syria, Ahmed, his nickname is My Dying Bride. <laughs> 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 he's like super fond of this band. And, They're uh, an awesome band. Uh, he's uh, insanely fond of um, um, Serkir as well, and I, I told him, oh fe fellow, could you record some oriental like parts for the tribute? He said, I could, but I need an oud, and it's an oriental instrument, which is similar to the lute. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so I said, oh, gosh, you know, I have uh, some connections from uh, uh, the Orphic Land fan club. It's Natalie Van Alst, from, uh, which is super active in the Orphic Land community. And I said, probably she could fetch you an oud from the Israeli diaspora in uh, the Netherlands. Right. Where they both live. And he said, Natalie, I know her. We met in uh, the Lorena McKinnon concert. <laughs> That's awesome. And, yeah, and how they met at that concert. So, Mr. Ahmed, he was he came to Lorena McKinnon, you know, like New Age, uh, like folk, oriental, like really high classical music. Right. He came there wearing his uh, probably Maida and Bright or some other serious metal band. You know, black t-shirt and uh, <laughs> yeah. jeans and, uh, you know, this grim, serious metal head look. And uh, Natalie, she came to the same concert wearing fancy clothes in ACDC style, you know, like uh, this kind <laughs> of awesome. this young cap and uh, tie and so on. And so they met each other in the crowd and they instantly, uh, like, became friends. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, you know, the world is, after all, such a small place, so all awesome, amazing people who love a certain uh, wonderful music, they just turn out to know each other. Right, well, it's a great example of how this, uh, you know, this kind of music brings people together. And, uh, and it, it does, too. It, it, it's funny how, uh, how small the world can be at times. Yeah, and Lorena McKinnon also inspired Matthias Kokla to compose some parts, and he even, well, kind of borrowed one tune from McKinnon. That's, yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Lorena McKinnon. She's got some, some, uh, there's, uh, what that, what is it, Dulcimer's Stomp or whatever is the name of the tune that got, uh, that got real big there, but. Um. Yeah, she's. I put her right in the league. Like whenever I'm, uh, you know, wanting to sit back and, um, because she can hit some notes and some areas with the way she does her music. That's you know very spine tingling or yeah, it's transcendental. It's transcendental. So, it's transcendental. And she's uh, you know, and again, she's got a, a another good way of uh putting a lot of ethnic feels in her music and she's yeah. she's a good pairing too with like the likes of like Enya and stuff like that good uh good way to just sit back and uh fade away <laughs> super eclectic and uh, one of a kind exactly yes and uh, so I could also talk a bit about the history of aesthetic fear the yeah. band absolutely so yeah, I could be considered the best expert on this band. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess we got like, the right person here then. <laughs> yeah. the, an aesthetic theorologist. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, basically, I published uh, the fullest 
uh, biography of aesthetic theory as narrated by a founding member, Herbert Heckman. Oh, wow. Yeah, and... Um, that must have been cool. Totally, and Herbert is another super cool, super eclectic fellow. So he founded um, a circuit with others, uh, and um, so they recorded one album, they then disbanded, then he proceeded to making serious, really serious uh, anti-theistic and uh, uh, semi-symphonic and uh, brutal, and it's pretty diverse, black metal. It was right. the second Austrian black metal band ever, called Asteroth. Asteroth? Uh, yeah, and nowadays there are over two dozen of uh, bands called Asteroth. <laughs> like, you know, demon black metal it makes sense. Yeah, you can find some in uh, Indonesia and in Mexico, etc. You can check on the <laughs> metal archives. But they were the first with this name and the second uh, black metal band in Austria ever after Abigor. They set the uh, precedent. <laughs> yes. So uh, Nastarot is also really special and eclectic, and it also features the vocalist from Somnium Opotum, who also played bass, bass on Somnium Opotum, uh, which is the first Aesthetic Fear album. So Asteroid, uh, the same vocalist and bass guitar featured on the first Aesthetic Fear album, and also same guitarist, uh, like one of the guitarists, and the drummer um, Milan Bejak. And so, um, after Asteroid, they were playing for many years, and they had some crazy gigs, like rock metal gigs in Austria, I so that. Yeah, Jesus. yeah, then Herbert switched to a super different genre. You would never expect probably any guesses you could make. So from symphonic doom metal to kind of black metal to guess what? I what rap? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bangula Bangula is about to record some rap, I know, but. Um, uh, Mr. Herbert Heckman, he switched to making industrial cyber metal. Ah, that was going to be my next guest, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no. Well, actually, it, it has become such a uh, a popular thing. That's another genre of uh, um, music that has a lot of facets to it. And uh, but uh, but yeah, that's awesome though, and it, and it makes sense actually. Always changing, always progressing. Well, it's just that that um that genre of music does have a lot of arranging and stuff in it, so it would um, make sense that somebody you know would um, go that route. Because I've found that like composing in that way rather than writing with like live instruments to now you're writing with. Um, Computer. It, yeah, yeah, it becomes very mathematical, but you're also able to do things that maybe physical limits, you know, don't allow you to do. So I could totally see why he would uh, make that switch. And it's also highly experimental. So his uh, latest band is called Pulse, and uh, this name is hard to move because again, there are so many bands called Pulse in very different genres. But um, so he's experimenting a lot, and uh, he, like the first album of Pulse, uh, ex um, Extinction Level Event, it's uh, like you know it's a bit of rave and a, a bit of symphony, a bit of Pink Floyd, a bit of uh, like death metal. Nice. So it's, yeah, and it's really energizing and you know vicious and powerful. I I was not familiar enough with this genre before listening to. Uh, Herbert's um, first album, but now I'm in love with it because you know it's, it has the same drive and energy as other metal uh, genres. Yeah, and uh, he is about to release his next epic um, industrial cyber metal album, Just in the Space. I even wrote a preview of this album. I could share. It's again, it's experimental, powerful, eclectic. That's. This guy, man, keeps pretty busy. He's already got two of them out now? 
Well, so the second one is on the way. It's kind oh, of okay. ready, but the publishing was a bit delayed. Right, right, yeah, Not like it does. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I wonder how much we're gonna be delayed for the tribute re release. But well, oh well. Well, that's another thing too with with uh, music nowadays is the the options that you have with release. Um, there's so many ways now that you can release an album and, you know, keep it really cost efficient for the most part um, with not even releasing physical copies, for one. Um, and then where you can go the physical copy route, you, you don't have to have the backing of, you know, a big record label all the time to to help you do it. You can do it with an indie label or you can even do it on your own with, you know, a little bit of loot, but you don't have to make a gazillion copies. You can do just so many. There's just a lot of options nowadays with releases and being, well, and like doing the things that you're doing um, that have become a lot easier with the current technology and the, um, the platforms that we have. Yeah, well, that's another subject I would also love to like discuss in detail. Yeah. And um, so, about the internet and music. So, in a way, the internet killed uh, niche music mm. in the one way, in a commercial way. Right. But uh, at the same time, it made uh, it possible for anyone to hear any kind of super rare music like in any part of the world and to actively discover like any chosen genres just a regular YouTube rabbit hole will show you all sorts of music that you didn't even know existed absolutely like <laughs> related videos and that's just YouTube and that's a beautiful thing <laughs> you know yeah some aesthetic fear fans actually um, found out about the band's music exactly through YouTube recommendations and nothing else. Yeah, see, so YouTube itself, the algorithm brought them there. That's, yes. That's awesome. That's, you know, I mean, <laughs> it, you gotta, it's, it is that, like you said, it's, it's like a double-edged sword. Because in one way, it kind of killed it commercially, but in another way, more people than ever were able to discover it, so... Yes. You know, if there's a way that you can capture that, then, you know, that's that can be uh, beneficial, you know, on both ends, so... But, yeah. Yeah, well, for example, cities, they're kind of old-fashioned. Myself, I used to travel really much over for the recent 12 years, like never staying in one country for over th three to four years. Ah, I see. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I never would uh, collect CDs. I mean, I have a huge stash of CDs at my grandma's house and at my parents' house, but still, um, well, I just, I have no possibility to, to carry them around. Right. No motivation either, because I always have everything in my, I don't know, flash uh, drive, uh, like any amount of albums in the highest possible lossless quality. Exactly. Well, yeah, that's another beautiful thing, too, is being able to get music that in that way with lossless you know quality and stuff and I'm, I've become myself I've become pretty particular nowadays with the physical media um, you know and uh, not just collecting <laughs> you know all of it because I like a few songs on a you know it's a lot of the uh, stuff that I buy is from independent artists these days yeah that's the main thing because uh, to to get going, to keep going, the bands need financial support. That's obvious. And uh, right, exactly. And uh, I think that is the best possible model of uh, distribution to sell digital copies, because, uh, for example, you don't need to pay anything for shipping, mm -hmm. and it's the band doesn't need to spend a cent on producing those digital copies. So you want to support the band, you buy its MP3s or flag or A songs, uh, you know, the lossless formats, and uh, you just directly send the money and you don't need anything like 
in return because uh, you can listen to digital copies. Exactly. Well, like uh, XR, XRP um, is launching, or just, just launched, um, all sorts of uh, stuff to help people sell um, their music and being able and, and I I would direct people towards that especially if, if you've never done it then having somebody like them being able to like kind of hold your hand per se and show you you know this is what is expected you know kind of thing um, I think it's awesome that there's uh, places like that out there um, you know like a, a radio station that does it but um uh Having band camp and stuff is, um, and amongst others, um, has become a priceless platform, really. Totally. Because, I mean, like, there's 99.9% .9 of the bands that I play on the radio, you know, with without, you know, band camp or Reverb Nation or one of those platforms, it's like, how would anybody, you know hear their music because before you were sending cds or a tape into a station and hoping you got on now you can directly send digital you know there's a it's even changed the game in that area absolutely uh, yeah and um, i would also like to refer to the examples of lorena mckinnett and california guitar trio and um, yossi sassi the ex orphan lad guitarist so, and uh, <coughs> again, this concerns only the band which already have a known name, so o already have mm -hmm. some degree right. of acclaim. So, Lorena McKinnett, so she uh, sells MP3s and flags through, through her website. So, she doesn't have need a platform, even for example, and this, it's the same about California Guitar Trio and the UFC Sassy. So, again, it's like the band's on the website. And direct sales, so all the money go directly to the person or a band who produced uh, this music. <coughs> and um, also another wonderful thing is uh, crowdfunding. Yes, yes. Uh, like Patreon and the California Guitar Trio, as well as Yossi Sassi, uh, the Orphan Land ex, ex guitarist. They made albums based on funding which they carried out line very successfully crowdfunding has opened up possibilities that you know would the ability to directly fund something and well, crowdfund it rather than having to you know pray that some big head record you know execs or whatever you know it, it's there's there's you know major label bands that you know have been crowdfunding because well the major label don't want to put their album out so they've crowdfunded it and it's you know I mean and even like um, I would I would use uh, one thing that really impressed me was uh, Radiohead was one of the first major bands that I ever heard of that that put a name your price on a this is a major recording artist <laughs> and they put yeah. a name your price on their album it was the most commercially successful exactly all. and it's inspiring it is it, it, it's you know it's it puts bands that are independent on the same level as these major label recording artists in a lot of areas with your you know, which I've talked bad about it a lot, but still, Spotify has a lot of its good qualities to it. It's just, you know, there's a lot of other people making a lot more money than the people who should be making the money. But, um, all that aside, um, these platforms have are just invaluable. I mean, they really are. Um, and, you know, and like I said, to bring it back, like with what you're doing, you know, this is uh, things that wouldn't have been possible even, you know, well, 10 years ago, you know, possibly. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's cool to see how far it's come and, um, you know, being able to, you know, talk with people like you and see what you're doing. So, yeah, well, an, an essential point, so five yeah. years ago, 
started crowdfunding for the tribute, historic cure tribute project. Right. Because we need final must mastering for yes. uh, because it's so many different bands and um, everyone has different equipment mm. and mastering skills. So we are collecting money t- to fund uh, professional final mastering of everyone's songs. And besides, we also there is a, a tiny budget for uh, cover arts for the CD, right? And also for online promotion. Yeah, so I'm hoping to find more like symphonic doom um, metal fans to get them engaged to crowdfund. Because presently we only collected like 20%, and I'm trying hard to promote the crowdfunding campaign for the tribute uh, via all channels. Right. Well, that's hopefully uh, we can uh, we can help you with that because uh, this this is gonna be really cool. I mean, anybody that has uh, even heard just a little bit of, of like the uh, the music that you sent me and everything. Um, to get an idea of what's being worked on here and some of the, um, well, like, I know personally, you know, like Bangalow, I'm psyched to see, you know, everything that he puts out I'm a fan of, <laughs> you know, so. He's really cool. Oh, he, yeah, Bangalow's a real, he's, not only is he just a work of talented and everything, but he's just a real solid dude. He's all around good guy and. He's uh, one of the people that um, is, uh, you know, that I would, uh, you know, refer people to in a way of, uh, like, the, the indie scene of, because of how he he does things his own way, you know, and has fun with it, and it's he's an inspiring fellow, for sure. Yeah, a self-taught rock metal musician. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's how you could put a real fine point on it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of the tribute participants, uh, they are also self-taught musicians, and a number of them actually started to learn how to play musical instruments because they were so much inspired by aesthetic theory. Wow. So, there's a lot that's behind all this, like as far as the, the love and... I mean, if you got people that have, they're a direct inspiration to them playing instruments to begin with. So it would, yeah. And, and another thing, they deliver really enormous quality for, you know, an amateur. Yeah. So about the teaser which we released, it only features like a handful of the songs, which will be actually featured, that will be a double CD release. So around 23 or 24 tracks. And then on the teaser, for example, half of the musicians are amateurs. But you can uh, you could tell from the quality that it's really top-notch because uh, they are super motivated and super inspired uh, to take part in the tribute because uh, the, the main idea of this tribute is uh, by fans, for fans of uh, symphonic, symphonic to metal. And um, another point, so about this tribute, uh, well, back in, uh, in 2007, I think, uh, some of uh, the fans of Aesthetic Fear were in touch with uh, Matthias Kogla, the composer, by email, and he mentioned that he had some new material, wow. which he could probably record. <coughs> and. Uh, so, being an active, enthusiastic fan, I started a um, kind of a petition. Uh, well, it was still... Uh, so, the idea was to support Matthias Kogla to release uh, the new material. Right. Aesthetic to try to aid him. To try to get him to... Right. I get what you're saying. Yep. So, I started a petition on petitionhost.com and... Um, uh, it was uh, I was spreading it uh, via last FM because, for example, if you try to spread something on Facebook, it's gonna block you for spamming <laughs> oh, <laughs> if, you're, if you're really active. And uh, if you try to spread something on YouTube, it's gonna block you for spamming 
if you really post uh, like the same text for many times. But if you use LastFM, you can um, send any amount of uh, private messages to the people who you really know that they are fond of this band and they listen to it frequently. So LastFM, even though these years it feels a bit abandoned, it was it still is, but to a lesser extent, a really insane uh, way for for uh, the fans of different of uh, certain bands to get get together. For example, Angel Lore, it's a splendid band from France, uh, which was inspired by Draconian and um, also by the Aesthetic Fear. And they're by the way, they're also about releasing the album, and they are featured on the tribute. So Angel Lore, they got together on Last FM. It's like two guys from France with similar musical interests who found each other in Last FM and got together and started a really splendid and unique band, Angel Lore. <coughs> nice. Yeah. And um, it was 2009 when I was um, having this petition and then um, there were comments from fans and uh, I think it was around uh, 80 world countries. Uh, the wow. people's IPs, not, not real IPs, but only approximate locations, like country flags were locked. It was 80 world countries. Wow. And back then I realized how global aesthetic fears influence uh, is. I, I can't believe that, you know, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of music, but... Um, uh, yeah, they are a prime example of that, you know, that very kind of symphonic doom metal. I mean, you know, that's just, uh, and I, I, I like the promo, too. Good job on that, by the way. Well, it's uh, the courtesy of the involved bands and a fellow from Canada, so Mr. Nick, who produced this video, he's really great and uh, he did a splendid job, job and we will release uh, a couple of more teasers with other tracks nice now um, you have what 75% of this is of the tracks are already recorded yep so there's really as far as uh, work that's left to be done there's um, I mean, like you said, there's still, you know, the, the R and um, a lot of uh, finishing touches. And it ain't like, uh, I'm tr <laughs> trying to make this sound like any easy feat. But um, as far as um, the, uh, the amount of uh, stuff, you've already gotten quite a lot done. Well, it's all the bands themselves. So I was right. just, you know, I was messaging different, very different bands. <clears throat> on Facebook mostly mm -hmm. and asking if they would be interested and uh, it's very curious like when I was messaging some bands I came up with the idea of uh, how, how to call it like parallel invention because sometimes like for example Forest of Shadows <coughs> do metal from Sweden and uh, some of their tracks they are really really super close to the sound of Aesthetic Fear's first album Somnium Opotum and so I messaged Forest of Shadows and it's essentially one man band with guest musicians and uh, this fellow he said well I have never heard uh, Aesthetic Fear and uh, then if you take early Lacrimas Profundere from um, uh, southern Germany so again uh, their early albums, they're close to Aesthetic Fear's uh, sound and they started earlier than Aesthetic Fear but back then Aesthetic Fear had not heard their music so it's a, so there's no a, real way that they could have inspired it, it's just yeah. a happenstance type of thing yes, it's like combining metal and neoclassics in this very special and artistic manner so it was something that was happening during the 90s, like from 1993 to like 1998. Or another example is Hackert from Germany. So again, uh, they were not any famous back then, 
and they didn't expire, inspire like uh, aesthetic fear. But again, it's like they call themselves themselves baroque, baroque, you know, death metal with uh, again folk influences. So again, it's parallel invention of special music in the same area. And one more example, so right, it was the, like Austria and Germany, they're close, probably like uh, similar uh, academic musical traditions, similar exposure exposure to metal. Uh, but then uh, there is a band from Australia, Legion, and you know, like uh, the difference between Austria and Australia. So in Australia you see kangaroos, and in Austria you see the cows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so Elegion, again, very similar <laughs> clothes and uh, intricate music, but again, no influence from, influence from either side. Right, well, so, they're uh, even separated by water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Vast amounts of it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, one more example is Imperium from Germany. So Imperium had not heard uh, uh, aesthetic fear ever until last year when a guy from Turkey who's a fan of both Imperium and aesthetic fear int introduced Marcos from Imperium to aesthetic fear's music. No doubt. Yeah. That must have been a pretty awesome experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was so. Well, it's cool to see how that organically happens, though. Like, there's, you know, these artists that have been making this kind of music running into these other artists years later that are in that same part of the spectrum and that they've never, you know, hurt each other, but they draw a lot of uh, similarities from each other. It's very, you know. It's very cool to see how that happens organically. Totally. So and um, so and back to the tribute. Um, yeah. So after that petition of uh, 2009, when it was um, like 80 countries, uh, like comments from people from 80 countries, I thought, well, it would be cool to make this tribute as global as possible. So right. this is why we call it like with solemn hope. Imbued a uh, global tribute to aesthetic theory. That's awesome. Yeah, and uh, probably now it's the first time when I'm naming all the participants, and the list is not uh, entirely complete because there are still some issues about agreements, and also the guys from China, uh, they only joined recently. So it's um, uh, there will be a cover from Alexander Karlic or Karlic. Uh, he's uh, originally from Serbia, living in Italy, and he's a super academic performer. Like you know, if when you think about academic performance, like performers, yeah, like uh, conservatory people. So he is like a professor of Oriental music. Uh, right. Yeah. The and elite then, of his field. Pardon? The the highest of his field, or the most elite. Yeah, I would say. And, so he's one of the few who had not heard about Static Fear before before I introduced him. Nice. So he, he loves uh, the lute, he loves oriental music, and he loves metal. So he that mo was motivating enough for him to, to join that project. Next, there is a band from South Korea, Ophelia, and uh, they were really strongly inspired by Static Fear. And according to them and some other fans from Korea, even though uh, generally there are not many symphonic uh, to metal fans in Korea, uh, still Aesthetic Fear is quite famous there, among this uh, niche uh, auditory, right. to put it this way. And, um, That's awesome. Yep. And um, also, as I mentioned before, Aesthetic Fear's albums were on the released in Korea, South Korea and Russia outside of Austria ever because uh, a local label they really really wanted to release um, aesthetic fear in uh, their homeland so yeah. kind of limited as far as region regions go uh, limited 
Well, it just you said it just went to, to what South Korea and Russia. That was the only other places it got yeah. released out of. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, CCP Records uh, they insisted on only releasing it uh, in Austria, but made some exceptions. There was, was, for example, a Brazilian label who also wanted to release Static Fear, you know, like re, re-release, like licensed copies oh, in right. Brazil, but uh, CCP, that's their preference. Right. Yeah, and then there is, a, as Autumn calls from Canada, and the band's name is identical to one of to an instrumental piece by Static Fear. Oh, really? Similarly, that band from France, which I mentioned before, Angel Lore, they took their name from uh, the name of uh, Tristania's song Angel Lore. Now, was the one in Can- oops, was the one in Canada just a coincidence, or did they take their no, name? No, they early in their career they were inspired by Static Fury. Oh, okay. Later, they switched to slightly different kind of uh, doom death metal. But still, uh, the original inspiration was there at That's the beginning. Cool. That's awesome. Next, <laughs> next, there is Chaos Descent from Iran, from the Islamic Republic of Iran, nice. featuring Flora Farzane. And um, Chaos Descent, uh, they play uh, really brutal, uh, kind of anarchist uh, <laughs> uh, death metal. It's technical and it's. Uh, very like you know strong and uh, aggressive but also eclectic they have as well some symphonic elements now and then and some ambient and uh, Flora, Flora Farzane is a professional um, um, opera singer from Iran from Tehran so she did the vocals wow, and nice. this is another band uh, and uh, Flora they had not heard the static here before but they were happy to join this effort. And you know, like, it's a brutal death metal band from uh, Tehran that even held uh, an underground concert there uh, because it's not safe uh, to be a metalhead or play metal there. All right, I was just going to say that. That's very dangerous over there to uh, even be in that genre. Absolutely. That can mean... I mean, I've talked about that on the radio, that whenever I see uh, people, you know, because we'll see the countries tuning in or whatever, and whenever I see certain countries listening to my show, I'm thinking, wow, these people are risking certain death just to listen to, you know, music. It's kind of, it kind of really puts things into perspective. Oh, yeah. Chaos Descent are really brave people. I think I've seen some other stuff about them before, to tell you the truth. Quite probably they released, uh, I think, three albums on a German label, I think. Yeah, it's probably more than likely that I've, uh, I've heard these guys before. Yeah, and uh, their cover, you can uh, hear it on the teaser, like a snippet of, snippet of it, and uh, their cover is, you know, like pure neoclassics, essentially. So brutal death metal people play in pure neoclassics. That's awesome. Totally. They also have a covers project, like heavy metal with the opera female singer Flora Farzane. Oh, it, it's it's really cool. All the the like the divides that you you know you're crossing, you're crossing, you you're uh, you're doing you know one of the the prime things that not only this genre but music has you know has a tendency to do is bring people together from all walks of life and beliefs and areas and um, you know all come to a uh, a mutual you know feeling of this uh, this one thing and it's that's a beautiful thing to see that and to see all the different also genre melding that happens with this type of music and um, the uh, you know just straight up just just that just the different genres that all have to be you know mixed together and again from all from different places it's uh, some of them even being dangerous it's just a wicked cool thing man 
Oh so, yeah. So who else? Well, next it's a band from Norway, and uh, well, there are certain difficulties about this, uh, uh, like their involvement, and it's not caused by the band, no way. But um, it's an issue with uh, getting uh, the uh, like covers released permission in the written form. Oh right, right, licensing and stuff is an issue there. So yeah. So we are working on that, and we we will hopefully sort it out. Probably I will need to visit Austria again to get that done. But uh, it, it's a really special and wonderful and cool and eclectic band, and uh, yeah, we really must get that done. But Norwegians. Well, um, yeah, you got to get some Norwegians on there, man. <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's not really black metal, unfortunately. I mean, fortunately, we're not. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, right. So well, they're just good at metal. Period. <laughs> absolutely. The next one is Angelor from France, which I mentioned. So yeah. it's mm -hmm. pure symphonic neoclassical to metal, and they are uh, about to um, release uh, their. Um, fourth album I think and it's it will be really a special album to check out so Angelor and then in my best French in my best French so it's uh, 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 no I don't remember the how to, uh, the exact name in Fra France but the translation is that no one had to die ah. it will be a, a total like bomb of uh, a pure neoclassical symphonic to metal with uh, post metal influences. Nice. Yes, and uh, the next chapter is uh, um, an online collaboration which we organized. So it's it was um, kind of an experimental thing because, um, well, other chapters it's like one. Uh, Band or performer from one country, at least like yeah, it was always uh, someone uh, who uh, like a kind of yeah not online collaboration. But this chapter is uh, a product of online collaboration, so it's uh, somber dance. Yeah, and uh, this uh, name band one main one man band name. Oh, and also a kind of a nickname. It's again, it's based on the second album of Aesthetic Fear. Ah. And this uh, man is Karim Dukfan from Argentina, from around Buenos Aires, and um, he was inspired by Aesthetic Fear's music to self-study uh, uh, music making. So now he's an, a multi-instrument. The list and also he does uh, mixing and mastering and uh, his own project Somber Dance he has uh, released around four albums but all on uh, YouTube as you hear as you listen to Karim's um, songs yeah. from the earliest to the latest you can actually um, kind of observe the evolution of his uh, musical skills right. so the, the earlier tracks are a bit uh, like you know, more raw and uh, basic, and uh, the latest ones are really intricate and uh, long epics with uh, many instruments and uh, really curious arrangements. Right, yeah, Just real, more epic in scale than the, uh, the beginning. Yeah, and um, so he actually does um, <coughs> all the recording and mixing in his garage, and um, uh, so and, uh, we call it the cave so he goes to his cave and he does <laughs> record it and he's also he learned um, wonderful extreme metal vocals nice. his uh, vocals are really cool now really versatile so he can do shrieks and screams and growls and everything yeah having dynamic range in that field um, is is a plus it's one thing to record it, but it's another thing when you see him doing it live. It's like, oh yeah, that's insane. 
For Finland, for example, they, uh, Kobe Farhi is also extremely good as a uh, instantly switching from clean oriental vocals to growls and also different manners of growls. Right. So back to the tribute to this yeah. chapter. So it's a samba dance uh, from Argentina with um, like instrumental parts. And then again, Chaos Descent from Iran with um, guitar and drums and bass. And uh, the vocalist is, it's also an experiment. So it's a um, female vocalist who had never done growls. But for this ch chapter, she uh, recorded really serious growls after some serious training, and uh, she's from Israel. So, and uh, Tamar, uh, s singer, that's her surname, singer, <laughs> perfect uh, surname for a singer. Right. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so Tamar, she is uh, really advanced, and um, her own music is... Uh, pretty post rockish and uh, she coined a special term uh, it was something like romantic doom or sentimental doom so it's like acoustic and um, it's uh, pure female vocals like really advanced and clean right. but the atmosphere of this music it's uh, pretty doomish I just got a band the other day that was acoustic black metal Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Please tell me the name of this band. And um, so, um, and next uh, there is another chapter by it's uh, another band from the same Norwegian musicians. Yeah. So it's the same set set up of musicians and they have different musical projects in very different genres ah so they're they're all they're coming together from different ends of the spectrum yeah at least they produce music from the in the same like in very different like, cool. parts of the spectrum and uh, they actually covered this chapter of aesthetic fear already in the past at the live show ah okay and yeah. Next, there is Ludi Nahalme from Russia, from Murmansk, that's up north. And uh, they play uh, kind of uh, rit ritualistic neo folk, but also they experiment with uh, neo classics. So some of their tracks is more like meditative shamanic stuff, like Denhi from Finland. And uh, some of their songs are, you know, like. Neoclassical nocturnes, and uh, so they made a folk arrangement of uh, an aesthetic fear track. Ludinahalme. And next, there is Where Lovers Rot from um, Portland, Oregon. Ah, right here in the yeah. It's a very cool symphonic metal band and also unfortunately little known or underrated so it's like it's really they deserve a lot of promotion well, and uh, sense of music in. yeah and uh, their leader and vocalist and uh, he also does mixing uh, Mr. Vladimir he is originally from Ukraine from Kiev oh cool yeah, but he moved to the U.S. Uh, like many years ago. <coughs> what, and what was the name of that one again? Where Lovers Rot. Where Lovers Rot? Yeah, they released around five or six albums. And oh, again, it's wonderful arrangements, many uh, numerous touching moments, wonderful vocals, uh, new classical parts. So it's really, really good symphonic to metal. I have to definitely uh, get hooked up with these bands, man. Yeah. Then there is the, an interlude. Uh, it's like a rearrangement of um, um, uh, one of aesthetic fear pieces um, as an orchestra. Oh, right. It's not, right. It's not a real orchestra, it's synthesized. 
right, but it's right, right. in the reach. Again, produced by Karim from Summer Dance from Argentina. Sweet. And we made it very atmospheric. Uh, next, uh, there will be an acoustic mashup of two songs performed in acoustics with um, a choir. <coughs> Ooh, yeah, by sweet. Nikola Tokoski from North Macedonia. That's the Balkans, the south of Europe. And again, he learned how to play uh, the piano and guitar inspired by aesthetic fear. <laughs> and so cool, you're finding all these people. <laughs> it's from the community, from the fan community of aesthetic fear. And Nicola, he has connections in the choir, so he can uh, arrange. Uh, li an actual live choir, that is cool. It's not super big choir, but the choir nonetheless. Still, right. Yeah, it's still in progress, not really quick progress, and yeah, it's from the 25%, which are a bit slower. Right. Yeah, and uh, another uh, performer from the community, it's Abderrahman Chabrane from Morocco, from North Africa, and um, again, it's another guy who learned how to play uh, the piano and guitar, by uh, listening to the aesthetic fear, That's and uh, he recorded piano variations, pia piano and guitar variations of a chapter which is originally pure metal. It's like symphonic intro, symphonic outro, and in between, you know, like serious metal. But he made a neoclassical uh, arrangement of uh, this piece in instrumental. And then there, there is Mr. Bungalow with his um, electric guitar arrangement. It's also because he's distracted with other projects, it's not very quickly progressing. Right. Uh, then there will be two bands from China. It's still kind of search in progress because there are all most difficulties about the coronavirus spreading. Yes, and that's very serious. Yeah, so yeah, we could pr proceed to the second city of the tribute. Yes! <laughs> yeah, so then there is another tra track by Sombra Dance by Karim from Argentina. And um, he, uh, he covered the first demo ever released by Aesthetic Fear. Oh, so really? it, yeah, it was a six minute track. And it was, uh, you could hear like the very roots of Aesthetic Fears earlier, later music in this early demo. But um, it's, uh, this demo is super raw and uh, it's like um, death metal with uh, some acoustic atmospheric elements and a repetitive uh, riff which is similar to early anathema, but again, it was not inspired by early anathema as I learned from the musicians, so, and um, it's, it's lyrics inspired by Lovecraft, you know, about those uh, monstrous entities. Yeah, a uh, big Lovecraft fan. Yeah, so is Matthias Kogla and other aesthetic fear founders. And, um, so this song, it's, the original is uh, kind of, you know, it's like, I don't know, four, 18 years old getting together with uh, basic uh, playing skills and uh, inspired by some death and doom metal and they record something with uh, cheap equipment and it's not really sophisticated compositionally. Right. So, but, you know, if, if you hear Mr. Karim's arrangement, and it's also, like, you can hear several seconds from it on the teaser, he turned it into an epic, I don't know, I could compare it to a full-fledged dark, dark Tranquility track, for example. That's so it features awesome. all kinds of synths, and uh, with all... The arrangement is really sophisticated, and really inspired and really powerful. So he sings in two rolling vocals and he added 
uh, female uh, vocals. It's a vocalist from Chile, and um, uh, his arrangement, you know, it really feels like as if uh, this were the original track by some wonderful and amazing and rare and cool band, and uh, uh, it sounds as as if um, Aesthetic Fear played kind of a bleak cover of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, if you take a seed, like which looks like grayish and uh, simple, and then a uh, flower grows out of it. So that's my impression from Karim's um, arrangement of um, On the Cold Winter's Morning. That's awesome. Yeah. So who else? Uh, next, a band from Mexico. It's Kronos Cantus. And. Um, uh, they play medieval music, so uh, I probably there is no uh, like early medieval European music festival in Mexico that would go without Kronos Cantus involvement. So uh, it's like you know traditional old European percussion and the string instruments like lute and um, uh, European. Um, early music flute and um, uh, bagpipes a lot of bagpipes they also covered for example uh, the uh, Game of Thrones soundtrack the bagpipes and so on yeah that's an excellent soundtrack a lot of kick ass music on that it's very epic Mm -hmm. so and Kronos Cantus they um, took an aesthetic fear lute instrumental and they uh, like og- augmented it and also added bagpipes. Oh wow! So it's a wonderful medieval ballad. Sounds it. Yeah. And um, next, um, it's Shadow Suite from Russia, from Saint Petersburg. And uh, I'm also this band's um, international promoter. Ah, so, cool. and essentially, uh, this entire tribute project started started with with the Shadow Suite. So, um, I have been uh, the um, uh, admin of the Russian speaking aesthetic fear fan community in the Vkontakte, which is uh, the kind of post Soviet clone of Facebook. Oh, okay. So, for uh, since two thousand seven. And um, so uh, I, I collected plenty of, for example, bands uh, similar to Aesthetic Fear in uh, different ways and uh, various curious materials. So I was posting all this for uh, this um, 13 years in this community. And then Shadow Suite, uh, they all are super academic musicians with uh, really cool um, a knowledge of early music of Europe and also church music mm. and um, they got together um, as a band and they decided to start with uh, paying a, a tribute to the great to the bands which uh, inspired them especially and uh, so one of those bands uh, is Aesthetic Fear and others are Imperium Theater of Tragedy, Lacrimas Profundere, Dark Sanctuary, Catatonia, uh, and others. And uh, so they got together and they decided, all right, we want to cover the epics of Aesthetic Fear. And Aesthetic Fear's album, it has a very cur- curious uh, structure. So there are two instrumentals. One is Dark Ambient, and the other is uh, kind of uh, lute instrumental. And besides those two instrumentals, there are long, epic um, tracks, Somnium Obmutum and Ode to Solitude. And uh, those tracks are have really, really sophisticated structure, and uh, their atmospheric and emotional content is really uh, exquisite. So it's plenty of changes, and uh, it's uh, really complex academic music in a way like it's metal but also academic music and uh, so Shadow Seeds they arranged everything 
and uh, they um, organized uh, two concerts in uh, St. Petersburg and they played um, both those pieces one uh, one at a time like uh, different concerts oh cool yeah so it's like the first Static Fear album it's uh, mixing is uh, wonderful when it comes to neoclassical parts but the metal parts are didn't always have a perfect sound and okay. uh, Shadow Sheet uh, re- like arranged everything from a scratch by ear just by listening to the CDs and uh, they uh, their uh, renditions of the metal parts are much clearer even though it was um, a concert performance so they kind of yeah they updated it in a way yep the sound is also a bit more modern and yeah. um, it's live sound so it's certainly has its flaws right, uh, compared yeah. to studio sound and um, also so one of the tracks is uh, 31 minutes and the other is 18 minutes <whistles> yeah <laughs> Jesus. so I would say that only do metal and progressive metal that uh, they uh, like to there are many tracks as long as that in those genres. Jesus. That's, uh... Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a long song, man. <laughs> yeah. So, 20 minutes. The, I mean, that's like the, uh, the old Anagata De Vida times, like, two, right? <laughs> well, and also, when you listen to it, it never gets stereos because it's uh, ever-changing and uh, it keeps you <coughs> focused on listening to it because uh, t- those tracks are just so good well well, see you get lost in those ty- that type of music too so it's like time is kind of like irrelevant <laughs> you Absolutely. know it, it's not it doesn't fit into the regular you know um, the structure that you know I guess uh, regular songs like you know, is a dumb way to put it. I've been accustomed to with trying to stay within a a three to maybe five minute period for a song where music like that has such an epic scale to it that uh, yeah, it radios. takes its time getting there, and it's you know it's a wonderful journey at that same time, you know. Yeah, and I already mentioned that Mr. Matthias Kogla he borrowed a tune from Lorena McKinnon. Right. Yeah. That's all. Also, when uh, Shadow Seed were arranging uh, one of the tracks, uh, Somniopotum, they um, recognized a tune by Tchaikovsky. Oh, nice. It's uh, only like a small small part of it, and uh, the tune's name is uh, like Little Jesus Had a Garden. <laughs> <laughs> so, just a funny thing to include into like a serious, right. dream, uh, desolate, doom metal track. <laughs> little moment of levity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so Shadow Seeds, even though they didn't uh, manage to break even with those concerts, so they invested more than they gained. Right. They still yeah. uh, consider it an epic start to, you know, to make a contribution to real music. And yeah, um, well, sometimes that's what needs to happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially for uh, like beginning bands. Right. And uh, essentially, they started this tribute. So it was like as if, all right, we got uh, like eighty percent of the first album covered. So we should proceed to the next album logically and release it as a solid um, double CD tribute. Yeah, we decided to cover every single track uh, Static Fear ever released. That's it's quite the undertaking, man. I mean, it, it when you think about it as, you know, not knowing much and think, oh, it's, well, it's only like, you know, they only got two CDs or whatever, but when you look at the scale of the kind of music and everything that's involved, that's... Yeah, and also, at some point, uh, like, um, it was uh, more bands uh, who want, wanted to take part, part than actually 
tracks um, released by Static Fear. So well, we decided. We decided, all right, why not? There will be like uh, two or three covers of the same piece and very different arrangements. So what? Like we saw no obstacles to that. Right. Well, that's yeah. That's cool. I mean, it's it ain't any different than when they put like remixes of the same song, except these remixes will be by a totally different band. Yeah. So and the, the coolest thing about Shadow Seed is that they produced professionally uh, mastered, professionally created uh, videos of the concerts and they uh, published those on YouTube so you can actually watch them perform and uh, it's really a special experience so to hear and to see those epics being performed I have to check that out yeah, I'll have to set up links to a lot of the stuff you're talking about. Yeah, I will provide a complete link, uh, at least. And uh, the next band, it's uh, Tyr from Turkey. It's a one-man uh, dark ambient tension um, synth uh, band, uh, which was um, inspired by Imperium. And the early Burzum, <laughs> the music, not the messages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, also some other like notorious dark ambient bands. And yes. it's led, yeah, this man is uh, Oytun Big Tash, and uh, we're in touch regularly, regularly. And uh, like I mentioned, Aesthetic Fear International Communities, and he is managing Imperium International Communities. Cool. Yeah. And it was him who introduced uh, Marcus from Imperium to Aesthetic Fierce music. That's wicked neat, man. It's cool. It's so cool to see how this, with, you know, the the small amount of time that they, you know, put out music to see what a fan base that this band has. Oh, yeah. And the Mr. Oitun is also um, self-taught, and uh, he uses um, plenty of uh, neoclassical instruments, also synthesized, but the samples are enormous quality, and uh, his uh, dark ambient pieces, uh, his own albums, he has uh, released three, I believe. It's uh, really curious music. In a way, it's more silence than music, but at the same time, it doesn't get boring when you listen to it. Awesome. Yeah, Tear, the name band. No, um, check it out. Next, there is uh, another um, kind of one-man uh, fan contribution by Hedna Galarda from Mexico. <laughs> and um, uh, she decided to take a piece of the 31 minute long epic just the piece she adored most and make uh, special arrangements with uh, Mexican uh, folk music uh, flavor nice I've been yep. getting uh, I've been getting into the uh, Mongolian folk metal that's been getting pretty uh, popular these days with a lot yeah, of yeah the who the who yeah the who is be they were just uh, actually in my state here uh, over uh, in the states here so um, I was happened to talk at, to somebody at a uh, dinner party over the holidays, and they had just seen him, and they were really impressed. Had never heard of him before, and uh, they were really impressed. Uh, that's kick ass. A lot of that uh, um, new uh, new folk infused metal has uh, has become pretty cool. I like it. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's a wonderful example how. YouTube created a global phenomenon. Right, yeah. And uh, back to the tribute, so the next track is When Vita Sang und Klang Verstummt. So this, tracks, this track was uh, the latest one released by Aesthetic Furious Matthias Kogla, and uh, it was featured on um, uh, an album Shatens Krieger of uh, a band Cross Hearts Garni. It's like a Tolkien inspired band. Oh sweet. Yeah, and it's a 
banned from uh, CCP Records roster, and CCP Records is uh, the native studio of Aesthetic Theory, oh, and uh, they're producing label. Uh, and um, so Hroskar is gra- Grani, yeah, it's a word from Tolkien, and um, from Oracle language, I think. And um, it's uh, plenty of ambient and experimental, and uh, Matthias wrote um, uh, a new classical track for it, with lyrics from um, Tolkien, also in German. Oh, wow. Yeah, and speaking about Tolkien, I should also introduce you to a special piece. It's kind of neoclassical, but the performan- performer herself calls it uh, future folk. And... Um, it's Olga Glazova from uh, Pskov in Russia, and um, she plays Kusli, it's kind of a traditional Russian harp, and um, not only Russian, like Slavic uh, harp, and um, uh, she performed a song in uh, the Elf language. Oh, and she did it in Elvish? Yeah, oh, from Tolkien. That is, uh, yeah, it's a, not an easy language to learn. Yeah, so actually she took the essential words and grammar from Tolkien's works and she made it a wonderful wow. classical New Age piece. I bet that's awesome. I'm going to have to definitely check that out. Yeah, yeah we'll see, all the themes that are in this are like some of my favorite things. <laughs> Amazing. <coughs> so when the winter is unconclined for Stumt, uh, the original is kind of neoclassic. In neoclassics, it's um, keys and uh, synthesized flutes and uh, like female uh, recitation in uh, German. And the cover will be pretty metal with some serious uh, black metal elements also. And uh, some vocals added. Awesome. Yeah, still uh, a work in progress piece, and um, there will be a live violin on this track, recorded by uh, Sunil from uh, Dominicana. So, Dominican Republic uh, in the Caribbean, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so this fellow will uh, record the violin parts for this piece. So. Yeah, and his band uh, is called Car- Caribbean Underwater, and they play kind of, uh, I'm not sure how to refer to it, it's just so many different eclectic elements, it's a lot of electronic uh, electronic sound and violin, and um, ethnic percussion, and meditative stuff, and some, yeah, hard to classify, but he's also a fan of aesthetic fear. That's sweet, I like hard to classify. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. And Mr. Sunil, so um, uh, so imagine, so you would record some relaxed uh, Rastaman style uh, violin parts in the like morning and in the afternoon you gonna record symphonic the metal parts. <laughs> That's a, quite the mix. <laughs> yeah. Rasta symphonic death metal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like a cool project. Awesome. Our next band is Ethereal Shroud from the UK. It's a, a black met- post-black metal band with a name, so it's a black post-black metal fans do know it. Also one man band essentially, and uh, it will be a, kind of a medley of different aesthetic fear tracks. Ah, oh, sweet. And then another piece, it's a very special piece, because um, it's um, getting back to the subject of uh, the history of aesthetic fear. So, Matthias Kokla, he is also a self-taught musician, so can you imagine like uh, composing complex 30 minute long like <laughs> neoclassics mid to metal tracks being all self-taught. Right. And uh, crazy, assen- yeah. So, and his background essentially. So, his father, Klaus Kogla, is a professional uh, guitarist and lutenist, also like super academic uh, conservatory professor. And uh, 
uh, so and uh, Matthias childhood uh, like it, his childhood his uh, house was always full of music and musicians and uh, I can read all this in the interview which was published uh, a couple of months ago oh okay uh, cool yeah and um, so essentially uh, imagine his father is a solemn academic musicians, musician he also contributed some acoustic parts guitar parts to both aesthetic fear albums mm-hmm. so yeah and uh, we found a piece it's um, a guitar classical piece uh, which was uh, written by uh, Matthias Kogler's, Kogler's father and we will make a, an arrangement for it oh wow yeah Did it you? will be by a musician from Vietnam that's cool so who else? well uh, about the lineup that's it that has been like 24 <laughs> that's a lot of people right. Absolutely, and the main thing is that all those people are motivated to, to, to like record to release it because uh, that's because this is the music that they love. Right. Well, and that, so, and that's the thing. You can get a bunch of like-minded people together, no matter what their their beliefs or where they're from or whatever. It's when you can find that you know common love for a thing that inspires people to want to be a part of something you know it, it's amazing what people can uh, can uh, end up doing yeah well uh, it's uh, some someone is uh, really fast like the guys from Iran or uh, the vocalist from Israel or Mr. Karim from Argentina they are super quick others are more busy or, uh, for example, the band from Russia, Ludina Holme. So they uh, didn't want to record synth instruments, so they gathered all required musicians like flute and cello and everything. Oh, wow. So they wanted to do it all for real. Yeah, and uh, that was also a message from the interview with, with uh, Matthias Kogla, which... Um, me and some other uh, fans contacted in uh, September when we visited him and um, uh, it was his also a point he says like he said he would really love his music to be um, played by live uh, instruments uh, like violin and uh, right. what else synthesized Essentially, only violent piano were synthesized on uh, aesthetic fear tracks. So he really would love to hear it arranged by real instruments. That, yeah, I'll bet that would be. Now we we'll have to. Uh, you'll have to also link uh, link us up to uh, the interview that you did there. That's uh, very enlightening. Absolutely, it was you no. Know, the time of my life to I'll meet bet, my, my favorite composer and all founding members of Aesthetic Fear. They are so wonderful and so supportive. That's wicked cool. And it's, it's again, man, it is wicked cool to see the uh, the community behind this. All these bands and everything that you're, uh, that you're working with, it's just, that's uh, quite the diverse uh, bunch of talent. But, uh, but at the same time, all commonly inspired by one core thing. And I think that's very neat to hear all the different um, walks of, of life and uh, musicians and the types of musicians that are all inspired by the same thing. It's Absolutely. Just, and it's a perfect example you know, that's one of the things that I dig about this the most is it's a perfect example of the, the power that music has you know and um, it, yeah. it crosses a bunch of uh, of divides or barriers you know than like the little imaginary ones that we set up you know absolutely and on Facebook I always uh, meet uh, more dedicated uh, fans of Aesthetic Fear who want to help with the tribute with promotion, with crowdfunding, and, or just to talk, and right. um, it's like different people from uh, 
Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, uh, like Vietnam, Turkey, and uh, in every case, I feel like I've known this person for ages because we have uh, subjects to discuss for our, for long hours. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just and well, the other thing too I wanted to mention because you know you mentioned with people that you know if people can't help um, you know monetarily or whatever. Uh, being able to to share things and doing that on a on a somewhat regular basis, you know they they might see one person doing a bunch of it as spam, but when they see tons of people, the little algorithm says, "Whoa, people like this, and more people should want to see this." And that's how you can really help. Is you know if you can't help in a monetary fashion or anything like that, being able to to share this info and, you know, the Indiegogo thing itself um, uh, goes a long way. Yeah, that was the plan. But again, it's kind of uh, most of the people, uh, like in the community, they are kind of, they don't know any other people in real life uh, who would be fans of aesthetic fear. Right. Like right. in Egypt, for example, it, yes. So it's only mostly online promotion only. Well, and, uh, and it makes sense too. Like we were talking earlier, some of these countries, you can face certain death for, you know, even listening to some of this music. So of course you're not going to be so keen on sharing it, <laughs> you know. Totally. But and you know, again, I mean, but that's also um, an inspiring and and at the same time a humbling. Um, type of uh, a thing to get your head around, and it shows uh, the power that um, that this this music you know has that uh, it's grabbed people and uh, made yeah, them want to band together. It's cool. Sometimes I joke that we are a sect, <laughs> a, cult, a cult, you know. So we have our Messiah <laughs> that lives in cult. Austria. And I'm like the archipriest who has uh, sometimes has some contact with uh, the like Messiah, and um, then we wa we want to kind of uh, have a second coming of uh, his music. <laughs> the ecstatic cult. Yeah, ecstatic <laughs> <Aesthetic> and fearful. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, essentially that's what I offered to Matthias during the visit so Matthias he is a mysterious personality so he's a kind of at the same time he is um, very friendly and right. distanced right so he I, I think he just uh, he's he's a busy man a lead programmer you know software developer and probably he doesn't have as much time to um, dedicate to the music now but at the same time, he is uh, really supportive and uh, friendly. And uh, that's the message I delivered to him in September. That, uh, yeah, so over those decades, the two decades since um, A Summer Dance, the second album release, uh, he does compose and write something at his leisure. Just, you know, well, uh, any musician does that when you have spare time you can just uh, blast play with your guitar or right. keys and uh, pen some lyrics so he does that and um, he does have a lot of material which uh, he doesn't have time to release but we as a community and we are around 8,000 in total now like you know registered cases uh, like on uh, in the online communities that's cool and uh, we want to we, we I suggested I offered that we can uh, if we can help in any way with the recording which uh, could be done by organizing things locally in Austria through German and Austrian aesthetic fear fans or as an online collaboration so we are eager to do anything we could to make that happen so this message was delivered and Matthias said that he would consider that. That's awesome that he even um, took the time to talk with you. 
I mean, he could have just as easily shrugged you right off, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, the fans can be really annoying. <laughs> so, he probably thought it would be better to just deal with it, huh? <laughs> uh, well, things are very slow when it comes to communication in Austria, <coughs> as experience shows. But yeah. hopefully, some someday, before we are too old, something gonna happen. <laughs> Well, I'm, I got to, I got to, man, I got to tell you, I am, uh, I'm pretty impressed with what you got, because you got quite the undertaking, and this is, uh, a, quite the worldwide, um, you know, feat that you're trying to, uh, you know, get together, so I'm really impressed with all the, uh, moving parts that you got, and all the people that you've, um, just gotten together under this common theme, man. Definitely. Well, it's you know, it's it's something that brings pleasure, like a big serious hobby. So, it, you know, it's no, it's zero effort. It goes all naturally and organically because it's fun to be to try to do something, to organize, to meet new people, to like. Yeah, to make this music last forever and uh, get uh, more of it. Right. Well, yeah, and... Yep. No, go ahead. Yeah, there is another big effort uh, by the community and um, uh, many fans uh, from different countries, they were asking if uh, CCP Records could release Aesthetic Fear albums on vinyls. Oh, um, yeah, on vinyl, right. Yep, vinyl. So, and um, we, uh, during our visit to Austria, we also asked uh, Klaus Brelinka from uh, the head of CCP Records if that is doable, and he also confirmed that is doable, but the condition is that we should um, have... Um, we should secure a selling of at least 2,000, uh, uh, 200, uh, pardon, 130 to 250 copies. So we should uh, sell, uh, we should find buyers for those. Right. Well, this would That's be a kick-ass band on vinyl, for sure. So to live with this really intricate sound. It, uh, it, they, yeah, this would really be awesome on vinyl. I could totally... See, listening to this on final. Yeah. Well, we actually found um, over 250 buyers for uh, the second album's vinyl, but for the first one, it's still uh, kind of in progress. The, I created an online uh, poll essentially. Like, if you definitely buy it, if you like 100% buy a vinyl, considering that it's gonna cost like over. I don't know, 25 euros and the shipping to your country might cost another 20 euros. So if you definitely gonna buy it, just, you know, sign up here, like, right. vote, vote, vote here. So this is how we're gathering the necessary amount of guaranteed sales to make uh, that happen. That's awesome. I hope, I hope they, uh, they could get, I'd love to see this, uh, Spain get uh, on some vinyl. Yeah. So, anything else that we need to, uh, that we should be knowing about this, uh, this compilation you are working on? Well, I could also share my experience about labels hunting. The label hunt? Well, what is the deal with the label? Well, about record labels. <clears throat> So the idea of this tribute project is to spread as far and wide as the originals did of Aesthetic Fear. Right. And so about record labels, I contacted around 100 of labels. which produce, uh, they pr the Only the labels which produce um, um, like doom metal, death metal, right. classic metal, black metal, so on the relevant ones. 
some of them are super big and uh, others are, you know, like tiny and uh, super independent. And um, uh, there was a tendency which um, I didn't quite like. So most of them entirely ignored uh, the requests. Right, uh, as so they do. They didn't say, like, no, they didn't say maybe, they didn't confirm receiving it. So it's just total silence for months, and I'm not sure whether I should uh, actually um, try to... Um, Can we pursue the idea? Them. Now, who, uh, how many uh, came back? Uh, it's uh, five to six labels, and... Um, that ain't bad. Essentially, so the, the idea was to um, uh, release the physical copies in uh, very different parts of the world, so it's easier for people to order them. For example, I know from Mexico, uh, from Canada to Mexico, or from uh, <coughs> the United Kingdom to Scandinavia, you know, when it comes to shipping of physical copies. And um, the labels I really enjoyed dealing with uh, is uh, uh, Hypnotic Dirt from Canada. It's a small independent label which um, releases uh, like uh, two metal and uh, neo folk and dark or neo classical, right. folk, like this kind of uh, melancholic aesthetic music from uh, very distant world countries, also, like from, um, uh, I don't know. Peru, for example. Cool. And, uh, so, so Hypnotic Dirt are really good, and uh, the main thing is that uh, the big labels, they normally pursue um, uh, profits. But the smaller labels, they have the luxury of uh, working for the idea, for the music. For, you know, they make it not for not to gain big money, but, but to spread wonderful right. music. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's hypnotic dirt. Also, the most supportive, uh, like uh, many thanks to Nick for all his advice and uh, like support for the project. Uh, next, uh, a similarly indie, small and uh, very little, little known. It's a GS production from Russia and. Uh, it's essentially one guy who, again, he only works for the idea to spread rare and special music. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, he releases so many bands, uh, like, from um, distant countries. Uh, like, uh, And uh, also he conducted many bands, like, less known bands to release their early demos and, uh, you know, B-sides and rarities. Cool. And, uh, yeah, he doesn't speak um, English well, and uh, still he manages to do that through Google Translate. <laughs> For example, he also was in touch with uh, Mike Lassides from DoomMetal.com. Uh, like, he released um, the international tribute to Paradise Lost, which uh, was um, organized by DoomMetal.com. Cool. Yeah, then there is Solitude Production from Russia, and uh, that is uh, kind of, this label is both big and really highly dedicated to music. So again, they released so many bands from Europe, and uh, it's very special music and uh, a very good label, so it was nice to deal with them. Then there is Repose from the United Kingdom, and uh, they also specialize in uh, doom metal, death metal, black metal, and dark ambient. Okay. Also s small and independent. Uh, then there is, uh, uh, I might pronounce it wrong, it's uh, Free Height. That's a Dutch word for freedom, free height. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's a Chinese label. <laughs> also, small indie and working for the idea. 
And then there is Juno from uh, Sweden. They are much specialized in uh, online uh, sales of uh, digital copies. Oh, cool! So you do. So you got quite a little uh, a start there. Yep. So that's not too bad. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I also remember. Should also ask the label from Brazil who wanted to uh, sell uh, licensed copies of uh, Aesthetic Fear original al- albums. And uh, the, the plan for now is to be content, contacting different uh, bands uh, belonging to the same genre and asking them to repost uh, this um, text and link in their communities among their fans. Nice. So, so some are some cooperate easily, others uh, require some extra, for example, money or uh, just uh, yeah. It's a little extra easy. ambition. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's and good uh, to see that you do have a uh, a bit of a backing, though. That you got people that will help you, and that there is a community there. Yeah, but you know, as a doom metal community. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. But uh, a community nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, generally, uh, well, there must be a correlation between um, a certain uh, state of melancholy and the love for the metal. I mean, that's obvious. Yeah. Yeah, basi- uh, Yeah, I would say that's people's biggest draw to it, <laughs> whether they know it or not. <laughs> yeah, so we do tend to get a bit, you know, dispirited or... Uh, yeah, depressed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well... <laughs> Un- that's how it works. Uninspired, unambitious bunch, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, and especially some doom metal composers, I would say. <laughs> or people that just have a screw it attitude, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I mean, you're off to a, uh, a pretty good start, and I'm glad to see that you got a... Uh, that you got these band, these uh, bands, these uh, well, not only these bands, but uh, some labels behind, and um, just a kick-ass community, man. This is gonna be uh, one epic, epic thing. Yeah, that's the plan. So, um, anybody that's interested can go check out. Where would you suggest? Uh, to check out the. Uh, you mean the tributes? Yeah, just some links that you suggest people go check out. Well, it's uh, first and foremost like uh, Aesthetic Fear, a somber dance uh, uh, video on YouTube. So, you know, it's kind of, for most people, it's love from the first sight. Nice. Yeah, so most probably if you fall in love with a somber dance, then you are the new member of our sect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So next, if you got inspired by Aesthetic Fear, you can check out the first Tribute Teaser. So you can just enter in YouTube Aesthetic Fear Tribute Teaser. So you can see, you can find the snippets of uh, several tracks, and also you can find the full covers by Shadow Suites uh, of those epics, of those long epic tracks. Next, you could uh, Google Aesthetic Fear um, Fullest Band Biography. Which, has, which I wrote like on, based on uh, the narration by a co-founder, uh, Herbert Heckman. And uh, then you can check out the interview with Aesthetic Fear. Both those articles were published on um, doommetal.com originally. But also we are working on interviews of the interview with, uh, of the translations of the interview with Aesthetic Fear. Right. Well, yeah, like I said, it's quite the undertaking, and seeing that you've already gotten, you know, this much done, it's pretty amazing. It's slow but steady, as I call it. <laughs> slow and steady wins the race. So is there, uh, is there anything else uh, fans should know about, or people that are uh, looking to get more info on this? Go check them out uh, on um, Facebook, Aesthetic Fear. And also, yes, uh, certainly. That's the, the biggest community, like Facebook Aesthetic Fear. It's uh, around 6,900 uh, um, members now. 
and uh, I always post all updates about the project and uh, also plenty of similar music in this community so and when you come there make sure to scroll down and to see all the posts over the latest year because there are plenty of curious things in it awesome and also uh, check out uh, doom-metal.com uh, just a kick-ass site so I'd uh, throw that in there <laughs> but, yeah it's the ultimate portable portal for doom metal news hell yeah man and in the community, uh, feel free to send message and uh, well to me, and I will just respond to it. I'm keen on keeping everyone, like uh, responding to everyone. Uh, and uh, for example, it's funny, uh, like several times uh, there are some people would uh, write to this community, uh, like introducing themselves. All right, like we are. Um, a concert organizing agency from uh, China. <laughs> like, would Aesthetic Fear be interested in uh, a tour? Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, I'm sorry, but that's not possible. <laughs> yeah. but, but there is Shadow Seed. And Shadow Seed, uh, well, that would be realistic. Right. Well, at least you can uh, try to use it for uh, some beneficial means. But that's what we call, though. Yeah, you got some. Uh, we got some killer headway, an awesome community, and uh, a pretty cool thing you got going on here, man. It was uh, it was really cool getting to uh, talk to you with all about this, and I learned a hell of a lot about some killer music. I know that. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, Indigo Go, like Swallow the Sun, they have a huge fan base, and they collected an enormous uh, amount of money, something like thirty thousand euro from Indigo Go on their new album. We are a lot more humble. We need like one thousand and one hundred dollars, or at least seven hundred on mastering of the material alone. So you know, if every uh, active Isaac uh, Fear fan contributed five dollars, we would have already got a lot more than we require. Hell yeah! Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully we can help uh, pick up the pace on this a little bit. Many things. I will be promoting and distributing this interview by. And uh, oh yeah, and we'll also uh, we'll also have this uh, over on Anchor FM, and it'll be all hooked up on all the podcast platforms over there as well. Perfect, all for streaming. So I'll be spreading the interview with the Static Fear links, the video, and also this uh, radio cast. Excellent. Yeah, we'll just we'll just plaster everybody with big link bombs. <laughs> yep. All right, man. It has been a pleasure talking to you. You have a, uh, well, a good evening over there. Many thanks. All right. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Yeah, stay in touch. Yeah. Bye-bye.
drug person can learn to cope with things like seeing their dead grandmother crawling up their leg with a knife in her teeth. But nobody should be asked to handle this trip. I want you to throw that fucking radio into the dump with me. Fuck, you've gone completely sideways now. That'll blast you right through the wall. You'll be stone dead in ten seconds. Fuck, that'll make me explain things, shit. Sure. <laughs> Fucker!